this next session is really going to be an interesting one. We're actually going to look at the Great Commission. So David Young, before you start, I want to pull up on the screen uh, the Great Commission from Matthew 28. So I hope everybody can see that. Let me just read it to us. And then David, I'll turn it over to you. Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So this is the enthroned King Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. David? Let me start here. Uh, if you get to pick your last words, I don't know if that's a blessing or not. It sounds like a blessing. But if you got to pick your last words, they would probably be um, pretty important words. Uh, so um, yeah, I've had the, I don't know what the, the honor maybe of being there uh, on more than one occasion when people died. As a minister, you get this, a pastor. Um, and it's amazing to see what happens as, as people go through the stages of death. You know, all these chemicals are, are dumped in the brain and oftentimes people are in comas or they're really unaware of what's going on. But sometimes it can be really um, startling to see the manifestations of what's going on on the inside. So I've seen people as they die, see the light or appear to see a light. I've seen them struggling too. Um, if you got to pick your last words, what would they be? That's the question. What would they be? Uh, there's a website out there that lists last words of famous people and uh, it, you can go out there and look at it. But the one that, that sort of catches me the most is um, Steve Jobs. Supposedly Steve Jobs is, according to this website at least, his last words were these. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. I just, what was he seeing? Well, we think last words are important because we get to prioritize the things that matter the most. And it's important to say that in Matthew's gospel, which is a gospel about how Jesus of Nazareth became the king of the universe, it's important that in the last words, the closing verses of Matthew's gospel, Jesus articulates our mission. So uh, his final words really are our first priority. And Bobby has read the words to you. And what I uh, wanted to do in the book, and again, this I was challenged to do this by Bobby, who has been discipling me for years now, is to, to look at the, the statements in Matthew 28, 18 through 20 as, um, as a program or five imperatives, if you will, for how it is we can be um, obedience-based disciples. How, what would it look like? So I've tried to break it down in five ways. I think this is a legitimate way to use the text, by the way. I, I don't believe I'm having to import anything. And I don't think I'm doing any violence to the grammar of the text to do this. So let me let me articulate these five positions. And um, the more I've spent time on this, I started the book uh, probably a year and a half or maybe more than that ago. I don't remember. And by the way, the very first drafts of the book, Renee read and um, was enormously helpful. And I think saying something like, you could do a whole lot better than this, David, <laughs> if there was something like that. And so I threw it out and started over again. But uh, when I, since I've started the book, I've just, the more I realize these five imperatives are so useful for thinking about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Let's start with this one. Jesus comes and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he starts with us um, with the, the need to acknowledge that Jesus has all authority. So we've talked about that. And if he is king and he is, then he has all authority. It really is that simple. And we've already had in our discussions that, North Americans do have a problem with authority. Uh, I think the problem's getting worse. Some of that problem, by the way, um, is, is legitimate. Uh, you know, um, social media has amplified this sense that authority is not always a good thing. But there are institutions and individuals who have squandered authority and uh, have treated authority uh, in unethical ways. And so it, you know, there is some health to questioning authority. There is, there is uh, I think, a, a substantial part of the protests we've seen in the U.S., uh, the protests are necessary and 
healthy and good for America, and that authorities in, in many cases need to be held accountable and need to be told we're watching and we're going to hold you accountable. But having said that, North Americans do have what I consider to be a juvenile interest in rebellion. Uh, so we're, we're sort of constantly stuck in this, uh, this pushback against authority. So we have, um, you know, restaurants that tell you that there are no boundaries, no rules at our restaurant. And I'm really sure they don't mean that. I'm real sure they don't mean it, but it appeals to juvenile America. Uh, we have cars that sell them, uh, their, their marketing campaigns feature people coloring outside the lines. We I mean, think about just what, what's really being said in all of this. You know, in movies, the, the women fall in love with the bad boys who don't follow the rules. And I think, Renee, it was, again, you who put me onto this. Elsa in one of the uh, Disney films, No Rules for Me. And she's, uh, she's the heroine. She's the hero of the film because she breaks all the rules. And it, so in a sense, I do think our rebellion against authority is at many times juvenile. And it, what it really says is that we are determined to run things our way no matter what. And I just want to make sure you understand two truths about this. The first truth is if you're running your life, then Jesus is not your king. It's that simple. And the second thing I want to say is as long as we are in charge, this world is going to be screwed up. It's going to be jacked up because we are not good kings. And so the starting point for obedience-based discipleship is the acknowledgement that he has all authority. He has authority over nature. He has authority over religion. He has authority over money. He has authority over our bodies. He has authority over our relationships. He has authority over our emotions and our feelings. He has all authority. That's what he says. I have all authority, which means that everything I do needs to be done according to the teachings of King Jesus. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. That's a royal claim. So my first statement is in um, obedience-based discipleship is to acknowledge who has the authority. He's the king. And by the way, I just want to say, I don't, I'll move on real quickly here, but let me say this. He has all authority whether you know it or not, and whether you acknowledge it or not. So as he says, uh, as Paul says of him, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. You are going to confess Jesus and you are going to bow before him. There's no if about it. It's going to happen. So i am just suggest you start now. Okay. The second thing he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. So I would say the second thing is to embrace the mission of Jesus. So discipleship.org, this is where you are. Discipleship.org is an organization of like-minded people who want to make disciple making the main thing. And that's, a super, super healthy thing for us to do. And uh, in large part, because I think for a long time, we sort of lost that kind of language. And um, again, maybe we made uh, church, church membership the thing versus following Jesus. They don't have to be inconsistent with one another. And I don't want to suggest they always are. But I will say, if you're just trying to make church members, there's a different set of strategies you would use than if you're trying to make a real disciple of Jesus. A real disciple of Jesus is someone is it, who is in a real relationship that makes a real difference in their real life for real eternity. Church membership, you can be a church member and not even believe in Jesus. I mean, you literally can. I don't know why you'd want to, but you can. And those of us who work for churches, as I have for decades, know that you have all these tragedies where all of a sudden a deacon in your church or an elder in your church or someone that you thought you could depend upon, suddenly you discover they've run off with somebody, they haven't been having an affair, they haven't believed it in years, and yet they were still good church members. You can't do that and be a good disciple, but you can do that and be a good church member. So I'm, I'm just arguing that the second step of obedience-based discipleship is to take on Jesus's mission. And Jesus's mission is to make disciples of people. That's someone who is following Jesus and bringing others to Jesus. They themselves follow, and then they go out and they find others. So, um, you know, if you wanted to bookmark the book of Matthew, you might start at 417, where Jesus announces the kingdom of God. And the very next thing he does is he calls disciples and he says to them, now you follow me and I will teach you how to go get others to follow me. And then at the end of the gospel, after all those chapters, he says, now I want you to go make disciples. So he gives them their mission. The third thing I would point out in that text, he says, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A couple of things about baptism to say. I want you to see, first of all, that baptism there is the process of bringing someone into a relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
So there are times when the Bible says we're baptized by the authority of someone. But in this text, we're baptized into a relationship with. So it is the Greek word EIS, ace, you know this if you study Greek at all. We're baptized ace, a relation, into a relationship. So that baptism act is the act of developing the relationship we need, this nourishing relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And just a comment or two about baptism. So uh, Bobby and, uh, and I uh, wrote a book with Tony Twist, uh, I don't remember now, two or three years ago, whenever it was, on baptism. And one of the things that we used as an analogy of baptism as a marriage. So when I married Julie in 1983, we loved each other before we got married. Our love didn't really change at the wedding. Uh, we were committed to one another. You know, she wasn't seeing anybody else and I wasn't seeing anybody else. We were committed to one another. We believed in one another. But in the laws of the land, and really in our eyes as well, we weren't united until we were married. It, that ceremony literally united us. So it, it changed everything about us, our legal status, our commitment to one another. So though we were loving and believing in one another before, it was the act of the marriage that changed our status. And that's how the Bible depicts, depicts baptism. So you have like Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. We were buried with him in baptism so that we could be raised again to a new life. So the act of baptism is the process of dying to the old self and then being raised to a new life. Or Acts 22, 16 says that when we're baptized, we wash away our sins. So in the act of baptism, there's a washing away of sins. I also don't want to miss this, that baptism for North Americans is a very easy thing to do. We have, we've had two or three baptisms in the last week at our congregation, even in the pandemic and the shutdown. Uh, but it's it's just not that hard to do. It takes 10 minutes in North America, uh, and it's a nice gesture, and we like it. But you should know that there are many places in the world, and there have been many times in the world, where baptism could well cost you your life. So uh, Jerry Trousdale, who has um, been a disciple-making movement leader for about 20 years now, and I think when the history of Western missions is written, Jerry's going to have a whole chapter devoted to him. Jerry has, uh, Jerry's actually a member of our church. Jerry's told me that when they take a confession in the places where he works, predominantly Muslim areas, they usually say to people, it's part of the confession, what will you say about Jesus when you or your family members are being martyred? They won't baptize if you don't give a good answer on that. That for many people, baptism, it is a statement being made out loud I am done with who I used to be, and now I'm going to follow Jesus. It's a decisive moment. So Jesus, acknowledge, we acknowledge his authority. We join his mission of making disciples. We are immersed into a relationship with him. My uh, fourth one is Jesus says, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So just want to talk about obedience. Actually, the last hour, I'll come back a little bit to obedience. But let me say this about obedience. Again, North Americans prize authenticity. That's our word now. We prize authenticity over obedience. And normally by authenticity, what we mean is we want to do whatever we want to do, and we don't want anybody to question it. And um, I just want you to know that's the cheapest form of authenticity out there. And um, I have to be careful because I have a jaded view of what I hear people say about authenticity. I, here's a situation. I had someone call me this is several years ago. They have a minister friend who had moved to our area, and this minister friend was having marriage problems. This guy calls and said, would you be willing to meet with my minister friend? I said, yeah, I will. Give me his contact information. So I contacted the guy, and I didn't hear back from him. So I contacted the first one and said, hey, I haven't heard back from him. Do I have the right number? And here's what he said. He said, no, it's too late. I didn't know this, but he's already left his wife. He's run off with somebody else. And he says he is now happy to be the authentic I won't say his name. Let me just tell you something. That's your definition of authenticity. Here's a man who stood in a congregation, made an oath to a woman. I will be with you until death separates us. Swore that oath before God and 300 witnesses and then thinks that there is something virtuous about breaking that oath because that's authenticity. I don't want to be authentic. If that's what authenticity is, because Jesus teaches me to obey. And I just want to say, obedience is the best form of understanding. My last year of, uh, when I was working on a PhD at Vanderbilt, my last year, they hired a professor who was probably the leading 
professor of Old Testament in the English speaking language. The guy read 17 foreign languages, 17. I'm not making that up. But he didn't have a lot of use for uh, following the Jesus of the Bible. By his own words, he did. And I'm not trying to judge him. Uh, in fact, he had to, uh, wrote a book challenging what the Bible says. This guy could tell you what turn the other cheek means in 17 languages. He could tell you the history of the interpretation of it. He could read it frontward and backwards, uh, all this. But let me tell you something. The guy who turns the other cheek knows infinitely more about that text than the scholar who can read it in 17 languages because obedience is the best teacher. If you obey, that is such a good line. Obedience is the best teacher. If you obey, you will understand. That's what Jesus says in John chapter seven. He says, anyone who obeys my father's commands will know that I came from the father. He doesn't say first you have to know it and believe it and then you should obey it. You start by obeying. Uh, so, so many times, um, it's through doing something that you actually learn why you do it. It's not the other way around. Uh, and then let me end with this one. So you're wondering what the fifth one is. It is this. It's actually an imperative, a, a quasi-imperative in the Greek language. Jesus doesn't say, and I will be with you always to the, even to the end of the ages. What he says is, behold, I am with you always. And I just want to play on that word behold. That is the fifth imperative is to behold the Jesus who's always with us. And I want to focus on behold because this, we don't have to do these things on our own. I mean, who are we anyway to do these things on our own? We get divine power. Jesus is already at work among us. He's doing fantastic, powerful things. And when we behold those things, then we suddenly get swept up in this beautiful thing that God is doing. Obedience-based discipleship is experiential. It's not just of the brain. It's not I just read about it and it was a great book and now I'm back to my life. Obedience-based discipleship is me not just reading about apples, but biting into an apple. It's tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. It's beholding that he's with me everywhere. It really does change things when we start following Jesus daily with our loyalties and our obedience. Suddenly we start to behold Jesus everywhere, even places Maybe sometimes we're kind of like, I'd like to get away from Jesus a little while so I can do my sin or whatever I want to do. When you follow Jesus at this level, when you're following Jesus at this level, you behold him everywhere. So those, those are five imperatives I think will help us with the concept of obedience-based discipleship. And I want to come back to it in the last hour and talk about some of the beauty of this. But here they are again. Uh, submit to the authority of Jesus. All things in heaven and on earth are given to me. Join the mission of Jesus. Make disciples of all people. Immerse yourself and others into a relationship with Jesus through baptism. Teach obedience of all the things he's commanded. And then behold his presence to the end of the ages. So that's maybe a five, five easy ways to, to sort of engage in the idea of obedience-based discipleship. David, I think that that's really good. <clears throat> um, you mentioned the book. Uh, we put the book in the chat box. Uh, on baptism. It's called Baptism, What the Bible Teaches. It's available as well on Amazon.com. I do want to ask you to clarify something uh, as we begin, and then Ben, I'd like you to jump in first uh, after this. But David, in the text of Matthew 18, um, when we have this uh, command by Jesus to make disciples, what I heard you saying, and I just want you to clarify it, that actually we enter into a relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through baptism. We don't have to be a disciple first or do something first to prove that we can get baptized, that baptism is actually how you make the commitment. Is that correct? You're asking me, did, is that what I said? Yeah. Uh... You know, there's a nuance to your question that I'm not following. So I'm hesitant to answer because I, I think you're you're asking something that I'm not real sure. Okay, I'm not trying to trick you or anything. So I don't think you are, but I, I also think you're you're trying to make a statement, but I don't know what the statement is. Oh, okay. We have a lot of people who think that, you know, baptism is something you do when you're worthy. And that's not what you're saying. That is not what I'm, oh, no, 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 no. So Jesus, so part of the disciple making process is baptism, Jesus says. You go, you make disciples, and part of that is baptism. 
Um, and when you read the book of Acts, where baptism occurs very frequently, uh, baptism usually occurs within moments of a person realizing, I want to follow Jesus. Uh, so in Acts chapter two, Peter preaches a sermon and 3000 people are baptized, you know, not 10 years later, they're immediately baptized. And then you get to Acts eight and you have this Ethiopian eunuch. As soon as he figures out, I want to follow this Jesus. He says, I got water over there. Can I stop? And they don't right then. They don't wait. Acts 22 is the same. So, so typically speaking, baptism, it, it's a birth. Jesus compares it to a birth in John three. It's, it's the first step. In following Jesus, it's the first. It's being born, and the good news that you know, what does a baby know when he or she's born? Nothing. You know, they don't know anything. They don't even know how to suck yet. Yeah, I mean, you have to attach them to get them to start sucking. They don't know anything when they're first born. And so, uh, yeah, I, if I'm understanding your question, what I'm saying is, when a person says, "I want a relationship with Jesus," you baptize them. That's good. Well, Ben, jump in. Give us give us reaction to what David's yeah. been saying. Yeah, this was uh, one of my favorite parts of the book, this and then the the part four that we'll do about the exciting part of obedience. But uh, I really love this. Uh, so clear, the the five steps. Uh, the, the Great Commission is probably, uh, if everything was taken out of the Bible and we just had a few verses, I would want this to be in there. And, uh, and, and you mentioned uh, about the last words that somebody has is probably important. Uh, I think the one reason why I love the Great Commission is so much is like uh, I, I'm a storyteller. So I go I tell a story, uh, but I graduated. We mentioned an introduction from West Point. And so that's that was 30 years ago for me. And so I remember uh, arriving at West Point uh, on July 1st, 1986. And uh, I was so naive and um, I, I signed up to go there, uh, came the first day. And it was the most shocking day ever. Um, and we began a four-year journey of uh, obedience and discipline and training and organization and leadership development. And I went there just excited that I was going to be going to school for free and I was going to be playing football. Four years later, on May 31st, 1990, I, I stood on stage uh, saluting uh, General Colin Powell uh, as I was graduating. And uh, and there they call it a commissioning because uh, you are taking an oath of office and uh, you are joining the United States Army as a second lieutenant. Uh, you have a chain of command. And so it for there, that wasn't the final part. That was really just the, the beginning of things. And so the thing I like about the, the Great Commission is those people that Jesus called to come follow him, they spent about three years with him and they were just regular old guys fishing. And by the end, he is commissioning them. He is, it's a co-mission that he is working with us to go in the world. And you just hinted at it a little bit in the book of Acts. They go there, 3,000 people to baptize. Uh, by the time you had Acts chapter four or five, there's 5,000 men. Uh, there's the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts chapter 8, Saul, Acts chapter 9, Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. Uh, you got the Ephesian disciples there. Uh, you got uh, uh, Apollos. You got Lydia. You got the Philippian jailer. And uh, we get to see how they took the mission that Jesus gave them. And, and Jesus is gone. And we get there in the book of Acts and we just get to see how they began to uh, live in that commissioning, that co-commissioning with them. And that's the part that I love. That's the part that attracted me to uh, discipleship. Um, it's the thing that even though I've been to ministry now for 25 years, it's the thing on a personal level, a gut level uh, that keeps me going. So uh, I, I, I'm just uh, very grateful for uh, your insights here on, on disciple making and being obedient uh, to the Great Commission. You know, um, the very interesting thing that you brought up, Ben, is that you kind of came acquainted with this, uh, not as a minister or something like that, but as somebody who was just an everyday disciple. Right. And Renee, I want to I ask you to jump in on this because ultimately the best that God would have for us is if we're all disciples 
who are helping make disciples. So it's it's everyday people. It's not scholars. Mm-hmm. And uh, talk to us, Renee, from the vantage point of helping people who are everyday people uh, to be disciples who make disciples. Thank you for that question, because I was just sitting here thinking um, my realm of discipleship for 15 years was two little people, my son and my daughter. And it took up 75, 80, 85 percent of my time. And um, and it's a scriptural principle that whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with much. And so um, I think that, you know, my everyday discipleship, my participation in the kingdom of God was very small and very isolated for many years. And God was doing a huge work on me, even as I was discipling my children. And then as we move into a new stage of life and our kids are getting older and going to college, my husband and I go, okay, hey, what's next? We have more time. And we said, hey, we're seeing these young families coming through this parenting class we teach, and they're desperate for discipleship. They're, so many times their parents have failed them, and they just they don't know how to be a mom. They don't know how to be a dad. And so we kind of took it from there. And then we had um, a friend go through not one, but two really bad divorces. And we saw uh, her children so, so hurt, um, starting to act out in ways that were going to be dangerous for them as teenagers. And so as the one um, began college, we said, hey, what if we had her move in with us? What if we just had her do life with us and just get a glimpse of how a man can actually treat a woman in a way that um, is a blessing to her? and a home that's a safe place and a happy place. And um, we just let her do life with us for the last couple of years. Man, there is no substitute for life on life discipleship. And anybody can do that. Anybody can take one or two people alongside them and do life with them. Now you don't have to let them move into your house, but I will say this, I'm an introvert. I like, I don't, I want a yard where I don't have to see my neighbors, where I can come home and not talk to anybody. And I let the most extroverted extrovert move into my house. And it was hard. It was hard. But the world we're living in now, the culture we're a part of now, this is the thing. Like life on life discipleship, even in, even as extreme as in each other's homes, it's what's going to help us survive the coming cultural shift. And so I'm just a huge, huge fan of this immersion in the life of Christ, getting in there and letting everybody, letting them see your works, letting them see who you really are and how you repent and how you try and trust and follow Jesus more. It's so beautiful, such a beautiful gift. That's the thing that's really great when you say, as we do at discipleship.org, and I know Renew does this too, that the, that the method of disciple making that we're going to follow is Jesus' method. As best we can, we're going to try to replicate the way Jesus made disciples. And how did he do it? It was life on life. Mm-hmm. And uh, life on life includes information. It includes teaching. It includes study. But it's so much more like, like you're saying, modeling and uh, the experience of, you know, with somebody who's a living, breathing disciple of Jesus. I remember a story of a famous missionary. who I can't remember his name right now, but he was in India and uh, he was working with the people and something came up where someone needed to live with him. And so he told the guy, he said, yes, I would be happy for you to come and live with me. And the man said, no. And he said, well, why? You, this is something you really, he said, nobody could live with you without becoming a disciple of Jesus like you. Mm -hmm. And I think that the idea of imitation is just so, so important. So David, let's, let's transition to this. When Jesus told us to teach all of his commands, 
Uh, he didn't teach us just to teach his commands, which is often how it's remembered, but to teach people to obey them. My question for you to begin with is, what are the commands of Jesus? Uh, is it Renee in one of our breakout groups was talking about people who identify as red letter Christians. But as we're teaching people that Jesus is king, and we want to be allegiant to King Jesus, faithfully following his commands, talk to us a little bit about what was intended originally about that. Which commands? Well, all of them. <laughs> and he actually says that in the text, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And, um, you know, so what we have are the writings of the apostles. That's what we have, the writings of the apostles and the prophets. And Jesus commissioned the apostles to do the writing. So um, he does this explicitly, you know, in John's uh, gospel, Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. He will remind you of all the truths I've given you. In Matthew 16, Jesus um, says to Peter, when Peter makes a confession, you know, Peter, I'm, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You have the keys now. And I thought a verse you wanted to just pass over. And he says, whatever you bind on earth, Peter, I'm going to bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, Peter, I'm going to loose in heaven. So Jesus literally hands the authority of his kingdom over to um, his ambassadors, his apostles and his prophets. So when we look at the New Testament, we're, we're looking at the commands of Jesus. And um, so you're David, let me just uh, clarify something here. You're saying that Jesus gave his commandments to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but yeah. you're saying it goes beyond that. He, uh, yeah, it goes. I mean, Peter claims this. Uh, you know, Peter, uh, when Peter writes in Second Peter, he says, you know, no scripture was given by private interpretation, but holy people spake as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And you remember, even he makes reference to the transfiguration, and he says, hey, I'm not just telling you stuff. That's some myth somewhere. I'm telling you what we were told to tell you. Uh, and, and, you know, Paul repeatedly, Paul says that when he speaks, it's the word of God. Uh, you know, he says it in 1 Thessalonians. He makes a point uh, in 1 Corinthians. Uh, over and over again, Paul emphasizes, hey, this isn't my opinion. And remember, Paul even says when, he, when Paul gets to the, uh, he has to defend himself in 2 Corinthians, especially in the last four chapters. And Paul says uh, about his own defense, he says, I know a man who went to heaven and saw things he can't even share while he's talking about himself. So Paul is actually saying, look, I went to heaven and talked to Jesus about this. And, and I can't even tell you what all he told me. So what we need to be aware of is that um, it's a really a real illegitimate uh, exercise to say, I'm going to take some of what I find in scripture, but not all of it. I'll take the parts I like and not the parts I don't like. And, you know, I think originally the idea of the red letter Christian movement, which is now over 10 years old, the original idea was a corrective that there were churches that, you know, maybe were emphasizing Paul over Jesus um, or book of acts over Jesus or something like this. And, and in that sense, there's uh, it, it it's probably a good corrective. Um, when, when I did my last degree, I did it on the Gospel of Mark. And one of one of my guys that I had been in school with quite a long time said, why would you do it on the Gospels? The real way to the Gospel is in Romans. And if red letter Christian Christianity is trying to correct that overemphasis on Romans, which, which is an inspired book, it's a great book. But it's just not the only book. There's other books too. Then, then it was healthy. But what happened was it became reductive. And so um, it was like we're following the red letters as I understand them. And not all the red letters, because I don't agree with all the red letters, just the red letters I like. And we'll throw away all the other letters. And uh, that's just one more version of the serpent's law. That's just one more version of the serpent's law. Did God really say that? Did God really say that? You don't really have to do that. We're just better off taking the whole counsel of God. Was that a long answer? Because it felt long. No, no, it's, but it's really important. By the way, uh, David's book, A Grand Illusion, uh, helps you with look at that question that the teaching of Jesus intended in Matthew 28 is all of Scripture. Uh, but that's a, that's a pretty big deal. So, uh, Ben, let me ask you about that. You've been in ministry a long time. I know you're very committed to disciple yeah. teaching. How do you help people obey all the teachings of Jesus? Uh, 
Well, first of all, I, I, I got to just, you know, self-disclose as I'm sitting here uh, listening. I'm actually, I hope I get to your question, convicted uh, by just hearing the clarity of the, the Great Commission uh, in my own life. And you had said something before about, you know, education and training and growth. And, um, you know, I remember when I first became a disciple of Jesus, uh, I was discipled by somebody and pretty quickly after I got baptized, he, he, he then turned to me. He said, now it's time for you to, the, really the second part here, join the mission of Jesus. I understood the authority. And he said, uh, you need to go, do, you know, you need to go do for somebody else what I just did for you. And I said, well, when? He goes, tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh, the, and so I'm so naive. The very next day I, I got up that morning. I used to be a pharmaceutical rep and uh, I was at a hospital. And I was walking around looking for somebody to, you know, help become a disciple. And I saw a guy fixing a lamp out in the parking lot. And I yelled up at him and said, hey, I want you to come to church with me. I want you to join me in some Bible studies. And, and the guy came down. He came to church. He, you know, he did. He got baptized, became a disciple. Uh, my barber, my brother, uh, my neighbors. I, I was just so naive. I, I thought it was just really simple. And uh, what I'm convicted by is just sitting here thinking about years since then, um, getting in the ministry, the professional ministry, going to school, you know, master's divinity, doctorate degree, research and things of that nature. I'm sitting here convicted to, you know, um, how I haven't really been obedient uh, to the first part of just going. Um, I haven't been going as a minister, like I need to be. So I just wanted to, to share that. And, and I'm not even sure that answers anything to your question, but it, that was it's more my... than answered because uh, <laughs> it's, it's the whole point. Right. Is we got to be what we want others to be. I can't even answer about, you know, teaching all that he commanded without going. Uh, I know that Jesus summed up all the commands and, and to love God, you know, with all your heart, mind, soul, the strength and love your neighbors yourself. Uh, everything, all the teachings hang on those. So I would start there, but before, you know, just thinking about w teaching everybody to obey, I would first have to do that myself. And I'm just convicted going, I'm not personally joining the mission like I need to be. Ben, thank you for yep. being transparent. Yeah. Renee, I'm going to give you, we're about to go to our breakouts again, but before we do that, I'd, I'd like to give you an opportunity to add anything that you would like. Well, I, I, um, I appreciate Ben's uh, transparency as well. And I worked for church with David Young for five years. And so I've seen both sides and I see what a struggle it is. So I empathize with you. Um, it, you have so many responsibilities and so many things um, vying for your attention and to do the boots on the ground, everyday discipleship. Um, it's hard to strike that balance. You know, once I quit my job at church, yeah, it was a whole lot <laughs> easier <laughs> to do it with people. So I just say I empathize with you and um, there's, there's beautiful parts to, to um, both places. You know, there's beautiful things you get to experience and see in ministry and all the all the uh, behold stuff that David talks about in the book, beholding yeah. all that God's doing. Yeah. But there's a sweetness, too, to just, um, yeah, having somebody living upstairs and just doing life with them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got to say something about that. Can I? Yeah. So Renee is ISTJ on Myers-Briggs, and they're the least likely people to have somebody come live with them. <laughs> but, and she is like a fabulous disciple maker, seriously, because she does it from the soul all through relationships. And I've seen her do it like with a lot of people. And it's always, I mean, I know it's painful. It, it, it has to be the most unnatural thing, but you make it look so natural, Renee. And I'm, I'm ISTJ as well. And it's like, I know what a stretch it has to be. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? Obedience is the best teacher, isn't it? I mean, it really is. And yep. it makes life such an adventure. to to Because you know it's not in your own strength. I know the only way this is possible is by God's grace. 
by his equipping. It's not. Yeah. This is really, this is a really good conversation. Hey, uh, before we break, let me say something um, to everybody who's joined with us. Uh, again, you should have received a, a link and instructions on David's book. As you can tell, this is really good material. And uh, it is our real heart's desire to get these kind of conversations and this material in as many hands as possible. And so one of the things we're doing is looking for men and women who will write a book review and put it on amazon.com. Um, 